everyone, I'm Bill, the Kids Pastor here at LifePoint, and welcome back to our Fall Harvest series here on the LP Kids Connect. Last week, as we continued our study of the fruit of the Spirit, the words, thoughts, actions, and attitudes that God the Holy Spirit wants to grow in the lives of followers of Jesus, we looked more closely at the third fruit mentioned by the Apostle Paul in his discussion on this topic in Galatians chapter 5, that being the fruit of bridge-building, unshakable peace. In discussing the bridge-building side of this piece, we learned about how its presence in our lives helps us to bring healing to broken relationships, directs us to work to end fighting and conflict wherever we find it, guides us to show others how to be forgiven of their sins and have their friendship with God restored, and motivates us to leave the individuals, families, and communities that we interact with in a better, healthier place than when we first found them. Meanwhile, in discussing the unshakable side of peace, we learned about how, much like the ever-present joy that we talked about two weeks ago, God's peace can be with us no matter what's going on in the world around us each and every day, and can help us to keep calm and carry on even when everything and everyone else is telling us that we should be stressed, worried, afraid, or doubtful. Why? Because at its core, unshakable peace is ultimately rooted in our relationship with God himself who loves us, cares for us, is more powerful than any trouble or challenge that we might face, and already has every situation that we're struggling with completely under his control. That being said then, this week, as we move on to the fourth fruit of the Spirit that God wants to grow in the gardens of our lives, we're going to be looking at one that I know that almost every person watching this video would say needs to be an important part of who we are and what we do, especially in our faith but is also the one that they struggled the master the most, the fruit of patience. Now, unlike many of the fruit that we've looked at so far, I think that most of you probably have a good idea of what patience actually is. Any kid who's ever had to wait to find out what gifts they're getting for Christmas, asked their parents repeatedly how much longer was left in a long car trip, counted the days until the end of school and the start of their summer vacation, or asked their teacher in church half a dozen times during the morning's lesson when they could finally have game time, understands what patience, or at the very least the lack of it, looks like. Patience, simply put, is waiting for someone to do something or for an event to take place while not being anxious, overbearing, or complaining. In everyday life, using those prior examples, Patience is waiting to find out what you're getting for Christmas without sneaking a peek at your gifts or constantly asking your parents what they've gotten you. Patience is sitting quietly, calmly, in the back seat during your road trip, knowing that you're not going to get where you're going any faster if you keep pestering mom and dad about it. Patience is realizing that while summer vacation might only be a few weeks away, whining about it isn't going to make the days pass any more quickly, and you still need to get your homework and class projects done before you can really enjoy it. And patience is not just letting your teacher at church complete the morning's lesson, but actually participating in it, knowing that they're just as eager to let you get up and run around as you are to do so once they're finished. Still, you might be asking yourself, especially given all that we've learned over the past few weeks about how much deeper God's understanding of love, joy, and peace is from the rest of the worlds, is this all that there is to the topic of patience? Is this all that God wants to accomplish within us as followers of Jesus as he causes patience to grow in our words, our thoughts, and our actions? That we don't complain about waiting for trips, vacations, presents, or game time, or, and uh, aren't disruptive or dis disrespectful to our parents and teachers? The short answer to these questions, of course, is no. While developing patience in all of these areas and more is an important part of growing up and becoming mature adults, God's primary goal for nurturing this fruit within our hearts and minds is this. God wants us to be patient with other people and with ourselves as well. To find out a little bit more about what we mean by being patient with other people and with ourselves, and to see how God models this type of patience in his relationship with mankind, let's turn together to two short passages in the New Testament, starting first with 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8-9, through 9, where the Apostle Peter is talking to his readers about why God hasn't just brought an end to history, begun his final judgment of humanity, and created a new heaven and a new earth, free of sin, right then and there. Again, that's 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8-9. through 9. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day, uh, are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 
next. Let's turn to Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, to see what else we can learn about the kind of patient that God shows, uh, patience that God shows to us. You may think you can condemn sinful people, but you are just as bad, and you have no excuse. When you say, are they, when you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God, in his justice, will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Have you noticed it yet? What God's patience towards us looks like, and more importantly, why he's patient with us. Ultimately, it comes down to this. Out of his over and above love for us, God is patient with mankind because he wants to see as many people as possible realize their need to be forgiven of their sins and, through his bridge-building peace, have their relationship with him restored. By all rights, God could call us to stand before him and be put on trial for our sin and disobedience right on the spot, as soon as we make a mistake and receive the punishment that we deserve for our crimes immediately. However, as we've talked about in past lessons, for as much as God is ju a just and holy God who must punish all of the sins that we commit, he's also loving and merciful enough to be patient with us so that we can have as much time as possible to realize the error of our ways, ask God for forgiveness through Jesus, and become friends with him once again, and uh, be spared that ultimate punishment that we deserve because Jesus took our place in receiving it. God doesn't just focus on the wrong things that we've done, but also, in his patience, on giving us time to make things right. And that's how he wants us to live out his patience in our lives, in our relationships with others as well. Jesus himself gives us the best example of how we should treat others with patience, and how he treated his own students and disciples in the stories of the Gospels. Throughout their time together during the three years of Jesus' ministry, Peter, James, John, and all the others were shown to be constantly arguing with each other, seeking to become the most powerful and influential in God's kingdom, trying to turn people away from Jesus because they believed that he was too busy or important, constantly asking Jesus when he was going to defeat the Romans and restore Israel's kingdom, not really listening to or understanding what Jesus was trying to teach them at times, and in his greatest hour of need, abandoning Jesus, betraying him, and denying that they even knew him. To put it simply, Jesus' disciples were a mess. And yet, each time they screwed up, he didn't get angry at them. He wasn't harsh with them. He didn't fire them from being his disciples because of the mistakes that they made, whether it was the first time or the hundredth time. He didn't mock them for their lack of understanding or look down on them for their weakness. No, instead, Jesus was infinitely patient with them, just as he is with us. Because he saw in them the potential that they had to do amazing things for God's kingdom through him. Even if they weren't following God as closely or growing as much fruit as they should have been at that moment. All that they needed, he knew, was the occasional gentle correction and the time to realize their need for God's work in their lives before they could achieve what he'd created them to do. All they needed was Jesus' patience with them. And that needs to be our goal as well. Just as God is with mankind and as uh, just as Jesus was with his disciples, we need to be patient with the people that we encounter along the way in our lives also. Whether they're exceptionally close to us, like family members or friends, or their acquaintances or total strangers. Whether they treat us kindly, or they hurt and wrong us. Out of the hope that in time, they too can find forgiveness through Jesus and become all that God has made them to be. Out of the hope that, if they're already followers of Jesus, they can go str grow stronger, more Christ-like, and produce more and more spiritual fruit in their faith. Showing patience towards other people isn't about us always being comfortable or happy. It's about waiting as long as we need to, even when it gets uncomfortable or painful, to give others the time and support that they need to draw closer to God, see the errors of their ways, and find freedom from the sin, selfishness, and disobedience that's constantly trying to muck up their lives. That is the whole purpose of our patience. At the same time, though, just as it's important to show patience towards other people for their own sake and well-being and for their spiritual growth, uh, for, yes, 
for the sake of their own well-being and spiritual growth. Sometimes we need to do the same thing for ourselves as well. Because we know exactly where our own struggles and weaknesses lie, it can be so very easy for us to sometimes criticize and belittle ourselves for our failure, and in the process, freeze our growth in Jesus and the health of our faith right in its tracks. And while it's important for us to always keep our eyes open for places where we can grow stronger in our walk with the Lord, for stumbling blocks of sin that keep tripping us up and causing us to do things that we know we shouldn't do, we must always remember that the work that God is trying to accomplish in us doesn't just happen in a day. Yes, uh, we were forgiven of our sins and given a new start to life the moment we accepted Jesus as our Savior. But the process of becoming more like him in our words, our thoughts, and our actions is something that will take the rest of our lives to pursue. What that means then is that on some days, it might feel like we've taken 10 steps forward in becoming more mature followers of Jesus. While on others, it might feel like we've taken two steps forward and one step back instead, or stumbled and fallen over altogether because of something that we've done. Regardless of the circumstances and how we feel, Hubbard, the most important thing for us to remember is that we need to be patient with ourselves as we grow as followers of Jesus, drawing closer to God and knowing that he's always there to help us back up and keep, uh, uh, keep us moving forward, even when we've made a mistake. I suppose then that whether it's with other people or with ourselves, you could say that the patience that the Lord wants to see flourish within us is a growth-minded patience, willing to put up with the uncomfortable moments in our lives for however long it takes to see God's plan and God's glory in the world come to full bloom and to see ourselves and those around us become more and more like Jesus in the process. Or, as Hebrew tw Hebrews chapter 12 puts it, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endeared the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured for sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you, for the Lord disciplines those he loves. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. The race of faith is long, my friends, and sometimes very difficult. But keep pressing on with endurance and patience, both for yourselves and for others, knowing that God is going to accomplish something great in each and every one of us, even in the most painful moments, as we seek his ways for our lives. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for your peace that seeks to uh, rebuild and restore a relationship with you, dear Lord. And I thank you for your patience with us to give us the time that we need to learn to realize the error of our ways and return to you once again, dear Lord. I just pray now and I ask that for each and every one of us, help us to not only develop patience in the events and the circumstances of our lives, but to develop patience with ourselves and with each other, that together we can each grow in our faith, either to discover forgiveness for the first time or... Uh, to grow stronger and more mature in the relationship and the walk that we have with you, dear Lord. Just bless our steps, guide us this week, and continue to grow your fruit within us, dear Lord. And we just pray all of this now and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. This week's prayer focus for families. Pray that God will help us to grow rich in his growth-minded patience in our lives so that we can walk with others towards forgiveness, new life, and greater faith, even when it's painful, and not beat ourselves up over failure, but keep, uh, keep pressing forward every day to become more like Jesus. Pray that God will help us to see the areas in our lives where patience is being choked out by weeds, thorns, and thistles, like, complaining, like a complaining spirit, belittling words, selfishness, anxiety, or self-righteousness, and help remove those from our hearts. And pray that, as a church, in this time of struggle and hardship, God can help us to live and speak in such a way that we can become even greater witnesses to the world around us of his good works and of the good news about Jesus. And finally, 
our uh, family discussion questions this week. In your own words, describe the patience that we talked about today. What are some ways that you and your family could live out growth-minded patience this week? In what ways do we see growth-minded patience in the life of Jesus throughout the Gospels? Do you think living out this type of patience is always easy? How do you struggle with growth-minded patience in your own life? What are some things that we can do in our lives as followers of Jesus when we find ourselves tempted to complain, look down on others, or on, look down on ourselves and others as failures, or consider ourselves as better than others to help growth-minded patients blossom in our lives once again? And, have you ever run a race before? If so, what did you have to do to prepare yourself to run? If not, what do you think you would have to do to prepare? Even after you've prepared and trained, does that mean that your race is going to be a piece of cake without any sh problems or struggles? How is running a race similar to walking day by day as a follower of Jesus and growing in our faith? What benefits could patience play in both? And that, my friends, does it for a, uh, another lesson in, all her, uh, in our Fall Harvest series here on the uh, LP Kids Connect. I have, as always, been Bill, the kids pastor here at LifePoint. Thank you again for joining us, and until next time, Take care of yourselves, be kind and patient with yourself and others, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care, much love to you all, bye-bye.